Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by this dark case. In the heart of Kilclare Gardens, a working class neighbourhood in the southern reaches of Dublin, lived the Mulhall family. John and Kathleen Mulhall were parents to three boys and three girls. Kathleen, whose roots trace back to the travelling community as Kathleen Ward, faced maltreatment within her marriage to John. Linda Mulhall, age 30, had a troubled life. She was unemployed, she left school early, and she had to care for four children after her relationship with their father ended. She entered another relationship with Wayne Kinsella, a man who frequently maltreated them all. This included physically harming the children with an electrical flex cable. Social services intervened, placing the children in care, and Kinsella served a seven-year prison sentence for his crime. Linda, with a history of alcohol addiction and substance use, had a larceny conviction from 1993. At age 21, Charlotte Mulhall, Linda's sister, also had a troubled history marked by substance and alcohol misuse. This was as well as several minor convictions for criminal damage and public order offences. She was also involved in low-end escorting. In 2002, Kathleen, the mother of Charlotte and Linda, began a relationship with Farah Noor while still living with her husband, John Mulhall. Farah Noor, who had immigrated to Ireland in December of 1996 under the guise of Shalila Salim from Somalia, claimed his family had perished in the Somali civil war. However, investigations into his background disclosed his Kenyan identity, along with the truth that his wife and two children were in fact still alive. Initially, he was going to be deported, but an appeal granted him Irish citizenship in 1999. This was due to his status as the father of an Irish-born child. Farah's history reveals a series of offences. There were past convictions for intoxication, threatening behaviour and assault. This was along with a deeply disturbing case. A case of violating a mentally disabled 16-year-old Chinese girl. This happened in 1997, which resulted in her giving birth to a son. Additionally, two other women bore children through assault by him. His criminal record includes multiple charges of disorderly conduct and assault. These even involved a violation with a sharp implement present at the scene, an event which led to three convictions. Remarkably, despite these offences, Farah never served time in jail. As mentioned before, the Mulhall's marriage was filled with violence and cruelty. John heavily maltreated Kathleen and the children. Kathleen had already gone through 10 years of a toxic marriage, and on top of it, she found out that John was cheating on her. Despite all of this, as a stay-at-home mother, she felt trapped and was afraid of leaving because of financial insecurities. Seeking help, she started socialising, and then she met Farah. In him, she found the affection and care that she so desperately craved. Wanting to break free from the unhealthy marriage, she asked John to leave, but he refused. Eventually, she reported him to the police, and this made John Mulhall finally leave the home. Farah then moved in, initially a situation that was bringing happiness into the home, but soon he revealed his true nature as a violent alcoholic. The decision to move to Cork was a hope for a fresh start for Kathleen and Farah. They attempted to move far away from the family rift. However, the situation did not improve. In fact, it worsened. With no witnesses, Farah would treat Kathleen even worse than John did. While he stayed at home, Farah found a job in Cork. He left her confined in a bedroom during his work hours. 
confined to hide the bruises and injuries inflicted by him. Kathleen spent her days in bed. She was left alone pondering the prior night's events that triggered Farah's anger. She hoped that changing herself and avoiding provocation might stop the attacks. After all, despite this mistreatment, she still harboured a love for Farah. Kathleen, enduring severe wounds from Farah's abuse, decided to secretly get medical help. She often claimed that she had been robbed to explain her severe injuries. After two years away, she and Farah returned to Dublin, with Kathleen hopeful that the change would rekindle Farah's more compassionate side. Unfortunately, during a night out, their celebratory mood soured into an argument. This culminated in Farah physically assaulting Kathleen in public view. The fortunate presence of a police car allowed officers to witness the altercation in broad daylight. And despite Kathleen's pleading, the police detained Farah. However, because Kathleen refused to cooperate or provide a statement, the police were unable to intervene effectively. Even though they saw him physically harming her, the absence of Kathleen's testimony left them unable to hold him, and this eventually resulted in his release. Kathleen's children, however, had different reactions. Some of them, like Marie and Andrew, were upset and moved in with John. While Charlotte supported her mother out of deep love and devotion, she didn't want to leave her alone. Living with Farah exposed Kathleen to his alter ego, transforming him from a kind soul in the morning to a violent man when under the influence in the evening. On the eve of Charlotte's 22nd birthday in 2005, Kathleen and Farah celebrated St Patrick's Day by drinking heavily and wandering off the streets of Dublin city centre. Farah decided not to go to work that day. His boss called in to ask him why he hadn't shown up, but it was Kathleen who answered the phone and explained that their child was sick. That, obviously, was not true. Kathleen and Farah had been drinking throughout the entire day. The two then called Charlotte, inviting her to join them in the city centre. Linda, Charlotte's sister, wasn't keen on joining them, but she was convinced by Charlotte. Kathleen and Farah were already intoxicated upon their arrival. Farah bought vodka and Kathleen bought Coca-Cola. They drank it while strolling through the city before settling at the River Liffey boardwalk. There, Charlotte and her mother took illicit party substances. Upon returning to Kathleen's flat, the women took even more of this substance. Kathleen discreetly crushed a tablet into Farah's drink. They wanted to make sure that they were all under the influence of the same thing. Linda, Farah and Charlotte were sitting closely together on a two-seater couch. Then, Farah started inappropriately touching Linda. He even whispered into her ear and put his arms around her waist, refusing to let her go. Kathleen, rightly so, erupted into anger. She engaged in a heated argument with Farah. Then, in the heat of the moment, Kathleen told her daughters to just end his life for her. And they did just that. Charlotte grabbed a sharp implement. She then struck Farah across the throat. This caused him to collapse. Linda then took a heavy object, repeatedly striking him on the head, all while their mother, Kathleen, observed the scene without lifting a finger. That day, Farah sustained a total of at least 27 wounds, but possibly even more the act was done, it was time to come up with a plan to hide the man's now lifeless body. Farah was subsequently dismembered. The women decided not to dispose of the head in the canal to avoid possible identification. Instead, they carried the head via bus to Talakt, passing through the square shopping centre en route to Tim and North Park. In the park, Charlotte used a sharp implement to dig a hole, and there they intended to bury the head. Kathleen discarded of the sharp implements and heavy objects used in the attack in a nearby pond. Later, allegedly, Linda returned to the park, dug up the head, and transported it in her son's school bag to a field in the Killinarden estate, also in Talakt. Using another heavy object, she then shattered it. 
before going on to bury it again to make sure there wasn't any trace of this horrific crime. Everything went unnoticed until that is 10 days later when a leg, still clothed in a sock, was found floating in the canal near to Croke Park. It was initially mistaken for a discarded mannequin due to the sock concealing signs of decay. The leg caught the attention of a passerby who then informed the police. Police divers discovered more of Farah's dismembered body in seven parts, eventually identifying him through a media-driven identification appeal. The crucial breakthrough in linking Noor to the Mull Hall women came from a Somali man after recognising a t-shirt on the recovered torso. Farah's head and private parts were never recovered. Following their arrest in August of 2005, the Mull Hall family firmly denied any knowledge of the events. However, Linda later reached out to the investigating officers. She confessed her involvement in the crime. This confession, made in the same month at her residence in Talakt, significantly changed the course of the investigation, an investigation which had previously made limited headway. Subsequent searches of the Mulhall flat in Summerhill revealed bloodstains matching Faranor's DNA to that of the DNA discovered in the body parts. After Linda's confession, Kathleen fled the country in September of 2005. She lived in England until authorities located her again in January of 2008. In the legal proceedings, Linda and Charlotte were charged with murder. They stood trial in the Central Criminal Court. The trial occurred in October of 2006, resulting in Linda Mulhall being convicted of manslaughter. Her defence focused in on provocation. The jurors accepted Linda's defence, which led to her conviction on the lesser charge of manslaughter, while Charlotte was convicted of the murder of Farah Noor. Following the trial, Charlotte Mulhall received a mandatory life sentence, while Linda Mulhall was sentenced to 15 years for manslaughter. The judge paid attention to Linda's substance addiction, noting her attempt to disrupt the trial by refusing to take her methadone. Both sisters were denied leave to appeal their sentences. Linda appealed the severity of her sentence, arguing that it was delivered without crucial psychiatric and probation reports. However, this appeal was unsuccessful, as the Court of Criminal Appeal upheld the initial sentence. After serving over 12 years of her 15-year term, Linda was released in 2018. She chose to keep a low profile and, in July of the same year, when approached by a reporter, she expressed her desire to move on with her life. She declined to make further comment. Do you think the punishments fit the crimes here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.